Our first reading this morning is from Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 9. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice, but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Our Gospel reading comes from the last chapter of the book of John. We have seen now that Jesus has appeared to his disciples once and then another time, and now we hear this other story that departs in a, in a few ways from what was going on before, and now happens in Galilee. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. <coughs> Jesus said to them, Children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in, because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there, with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, a hundred and fifty-three of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? more than these. He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he, had, he said it to them the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go wherever you wish. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will fasten the belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which you would glorify God. After this, he said to him, Follow me. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. 
If you've seen the last movie in the Lord of the Rings series, you know that it has an ending that never ends. Uh, there, there's a, a triumphal battle. That's uh, the, the first sort of ending, and, and they win the victory, and that would have been a good place to stop. And then there is the crowning of the king, and, and a marriage, and that would have been a good place to stop. But then the, the hobbits go home, and they return back to their normal life, and nobody understands, but they exchange no influences, and that would have been a fine place to stop. Uh, but then they, they go forth to uh, a boat where they say goodbye to the elves and to Gandalf, and that was where it finally stopped. If you watch it, at least to me, it, it felt like the endings lasted longer than the movie itself, which is saying something, because it was not a short movie. <laughs> Every time it seems to end, there was another coda, there was another ending added on to the movie. But if you were the type who would really enjoy the films, right? If you were the type that, that loved to be in a world of, of elves and dwarves and wizards and hobbits, each ending was a sort of reprieve. Each ending was a way to stay just a little bit longer in that world, to, to be there just for a little bit longer. The book of John, in the same way, sort of has two endings. At the ending of chapter 20, John ties everything up in a pretty good bow, to be honest. It, it, John uh, chapter 20, verse 31 goes like this. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. That would have been a pretty good ending. But immediately following that, we have a, a, a new thing, another ending. And it gives us a, a different sort of closure, its own sort of closure. This allows us, just like watching Lord of the Rings, to linger a little bit more in this sort of incredible, magical, post-Easter time. Soon, we will go forth to do the work that we're called to do, but for now, we can remain in the joy of Easter, still rejoicing and dumbfounded with the disciples at God's victory over death, God's reversal of Rome's execution, that incredible, glorious Easter morning. The machinery of death had run its course, and God said no, and instead replaced it with a word of yes. Yes, to life. And the light of resurrection cast out all of the shadows that death had cast over the world. The days following Easter are this time when, when everyone is filled with shock and joy and it feels like anything could happen. There were a time when Jesus might pop up anywhere, walking down a road, hold up in your own home, even going fishing. As a time when the miraculous is not just possible, but it's happening all the time. For this second ending, the, the setting has changed. Now we are in Galilee, and we are on the side of the Sea of Tiberias. The last time that they were by the Sea of Tiberias, Jesus had taken bread and he had broken it, and he had used a few small loaves and a few small fishes to feed multitudes. And, and for some reason they're there, and Peter up and decides that he is going fishing. Peter is well known as a, as a fisherman before he became a disciple, and we might read into this uh, that Peter is ready, I guess, for things to go back to normal. It feels for Peter like things are over, like it has ended, like this time in which miracles were ever present in his life, is, is gone, and now it's time to be practical. Now it's time to get back to the business of doing what you have to do. It's time to go back to his normal life. But there's no way of going back to the way things were before Easter. Post-Easter, life is different because life is now possible where only death was possible before. They now live in an age of miracles, and when they go fishing, that's revealed. They, they go out, and they catch no fish. And then a stranger tells them, why don't, you, why don't you toss your nets on the right side of the boat? Surely they have done this. 
Surely they knew what they were doing. They, many of them were career fishermen, and yet they do it, and all of a sudden there are so many fish that the nets ought to break, but they don't. The disciple whom Jesus loved recognizes this for the miracle that it is, and he says, it is the Lord. And immediately Peter realizes it is not over. And he hitches up his, uh, his bridges and he dives in the water and he swims straight for Jesus. And he finds Jesus sitting by a charcoal fire. And when we see that charcoal fire, we're reminded of another fire, right? We're reminded of, of, of the last time that, that uh, Peter had spoken of Jesus in our gospel. When he stood by a charcoal fire, warming himself, and he denied Jesus three times. This wasn't just an, an act of cowardice, it was an act of rejection. It was a, a much more profound thing. At the Last Supper, G Peter said to Jesus, I will go anywhere that you go. I will lay down my life for you. But then just hours later, People are asking, hey, were, were you with that Jesus guy? Oh no, I am not. Oh no, I do not know him. Why do you keep asking me this question? Of course, I do not know him. At the Last Supper, he seemed to know what it meant to take up his cross. But just hours later, he's given the opportunity three times, and every single time he rejects it. We might think of his three denials as denials of the past, present, and future. Peter denied that he had any part in what Jesus had done up to that point. I am not with him. He denied that he would join in what Jesus was going through. I won't walk this lonesome valley that Jesus will walk. And he denied any part in the future that Jesus would have, probably because at that moment Peter saw no future for Christ but crucifixion. But now, on the other side of resurrection, Jesus asks Peter to affirm him three times. Simon, son of John, do you love me? And each time Peter says yes, and each time Jesus says, some variant of feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. I used to read a book to Jane. Uh, it was a Sesame Street book, and Bert has gone off to a Hooper store to help out for a day, because Hooper's got to be away somewhere. And Bert breaks Hooper's favorite teapot. The book is him trying to, to fix the teapot, but of course, you know, a, a ceramic pot is not to be fixed. There's no hope. And, and finally, the book ends with Hooper saying to Bert, your friendship means more to me than anything, than any teapot. And in a way, Jesus is saying this to Peter, right? Your friendship means more to me than any betrayal. Your friendship means more to me even than my own life. This is the forgiveness that we can see in the light of the resurrection. This is not just a, oh, oh, you know, whatever, it's nothing. It is, it is something, and yet, and yet my love is so much bigger. My love is so much bigger than anything that you could do to hurt me, to reject me, to betray me, even to kill me. Jesus, betrayed by Peter, he has gone to new life. And now he offers Peter, who, who cut himself off from new life by denying Jesus, now in forgiveness, Peter receives new life also. But that new life doesn't come with a return to normalcy. That new life comes with a purpose. Every time Peter professes his love for Jesus, Jesus says, feed my lambs. Sometimes we are like Peter, right? We loudly proclaim our faithfulness. But when the moment comes to take up our own cross, we are unwilling to lift a finger. We give up our own words as lies, as things that perhaps even we didn't believe at the time. When we say one thing and we do another, we live up to every uh, complaint that anyone has about hypocrisy in the church. 
All of these things cut us off from Christ. We deny ourselves when we do this from participating in his past, in his present, and in his future. But Christ's forgiveness restores us. Not so that we can go back to business as usual, and not so that we can again imagine ourselves to be great heroes of faith who then do nothing. The point is, we're not forgiven to return back to normal. We're forgiven to be sent out, to be a part of bringing forth that resurrection wherever we go. We're forgiven so that we can once more be united with Christ in His life, in His death, and in His resurrection. We are forgiven, forgiven. Forgiving the way that Christ did, when He blessed and broke the bread and took such small amounts, knowing that God would make them feed multitudes. Forgiving the way Christ did when he washed his disciples' feet, telling us that the way that leads to life is giving our own lives away to others. Forgiving the way that Christ did, choosing to obey when his life was at risk, when his friends had scattered like sheep, giving himself over to God's will in humble obedience for humankind. The appearance of Christ calls us to live in a new life, where the shadow of death does not follow us, where the highest honor is gained by being a servant of others. When we confront the world's no, the rejection of life and faith and hopefulness, we are armed with God's yes. God's yes to life, God's yes to love, God's yes to forgiveness, to grace that opens to us new life, that provides a broken Peter a new hope for himself, and provides us, broken people, new life for ourselves. The forgiveness of Christ breaks through our denials, breaks through our failures, breaks through our rejection, and restores us once more in grace with an opportunity to live in him. The second conclusion of John, or the extended cut, as I like to call it, pushes us past the recognition of Easter and into the repercussions of Easter. The first ending of Mark that we talked about, or of John that we talked about last week, ends with Thomas saying, My Lord and my God, he recognizes what is going on. But but now we see Peter being sent, Peter being taught what it means that Jesus is my Lord and my God, and it means feed my lambs. Friends, we are still living in a post-Easter world. We are still living in the light of the resurrection. We are living in a time where Jesus might pop up anywhere. In the stillness of a cruel morning, in the words of a friend and a person who comes to us in need, Jesus might pop up anywhere. We're still living in that resounding echo of God's no to death and yes to life. This Easter time, therefore, for us does not end here. Like Peter, we can't go back to normal either. We can only go forward, leaving our past and our failures behind, and being reborn into the forgiveness of Christ. Forgiveness restores us to Christ's past, to Christ's presence, and above all, to the future that Christ has made for us. Life, death, and resurrection. We are forgiven to be brought into that resurrection, and we are forgiven to be sent forth so that we might serve as He served. We are forgiven so that we can give as He gave. We are forgiven 